Hey, welcome to my channel. My name is Llewellyn. I want to thank you so much for being here. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. As this time I'm working on another continuation of the June Hunt um, domestic violence book. I thought that everyone could learn something from it. I know I have been. So here it goes for the continuation. If you have not been paying attention or following along, please go back and start with the very first one because there's a lot of information. Okay, so why does he do it? Behavior does not come out of a vacuum, but out of a person's heart, environment, and personal experience. Each person is born with a propensity towards self-will and is raised in an environment that either promotes violence and abuse or promotes love and respect. Beliefs about God, self, and others. I hit a button. Let's try it again. <laughs> Beliefs about God, self, and others are formed, and behavior naturally follows. Research has indicated that young boys who witness violence between their parents triple their chances of becoming abusive husbands. Scary thought. The home where a woman is devalued and traumatized becomes a more impactful model for inciting violence in boys than does being assaulted as a teenager. It is estimated that more than 3 million children are witnesses to spousal abuse in the United States each year as the parents fail to heed the wise words of the writer of Proverbs. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old or mature, he will not turn from it. You know, that is so true about the 3 million children that actually witnessed that. I know my children did. And the thought of it, if you haven't seen it, go back to Speak Up, and I'll tell you about it because... <sighs> You talk about scared. They know more than what you realize they know. All right, so he does it because he grew up watching abuse between his parents. He experienced abuse as a child. He views people as possessions rather than people. He loves things and uses people instead of loving people and using things. He hasn't been taught how to love. He understands love to be conditional if she pleases him, she will avoid his wrath and vindictiveness. But this also goes for she has not been taught how to love too. So even though it says he in here, I think the writer should have done he and she or they because men get abused too. It's not just women. Um, he thinks he has the right to control her. He thinks he has the right to use force on her. He fears she will be unfaithful. He fears losing her. He becomes angry when she shows weakness. He sees himself as a victim. He thinks she has taken power from him. He blames her for his low self-esteem. He believes his power demonstrates his superiority. He wants to feel significant and in control. He possesses an unbiblical view of submission and authority. He handles stress immaturely. He has few or no coping skills. He thinks violence is the way to get even or to retaliate. He has learned that violence and other forms of abuse work. He hasn't suffered strong enough repercussions to deter him. The writer of Ecclesiastes explains the impact on an abuser's heart when consequences are delayed. So Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. So why doesn't she leave? It's a very good question. Let's find out. Those who grew up in healthy, non-abusive homes have no frame of reference for those who bow to abuse. But those who grew up in abusive homes know all too well the reasons why the abused not only allow abuse, but also stay with their abusers. They understand the mentality because it is their mentality. They lived it as, a, as children, and now they are living it as adults. They are caught up in the snare of abuse. However, the Bible makes it clear. Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. An abused woman chooses not to leave her abuser for a variety of reasons. Reasons understood by all who have stood in her shoes, walked down her street, and shared in her sorrows. She doesn't leave because of what she firmly believes and falsely feels. That is so true. She doesn't leave because of what she fully believes. 
She believes she doesn't have a biblical right to separate in order to achieve a healthy relationship. She believes abuse is normal and that she must accept it. That's what I did. She believes she must protect the family image at all costs. She believes family problems are private and can't be shared. She believes she has to stay because of what spiritual leaders say. She believes the promises of her abuser to never do it again. Again, that was me. She believes being a peace at any price person is being loyal and godly. She believes her husband and children are all she has. She believes political, excuse me, she believes biblical submission and marriage permits abuse. She believes there are no organizations or services to help her. I know I didn't know anything about that. And what she falsely feels, she feels helpless as if she has no power to leave or to make it on her own. She feels she has no real worth or value. So true. She feels manipulated by threats of suicide. She feels she deserves to be abused and blames herself. She feels isolated from supportive people. She feels too much shame to tell about the abuse. She feels she is not heard or understood when she does share. She feels that others don't want to hear about the abuse. She feels that explaining the details of the abuse, again, costs too much both emotionally and physically. She feels that having two parents in an unhealthy relationship is better, than for, is better for the children than having only one healthy parent. What she firmly fears. She fears if she tells and then he changes, people won't forgive him. She fears that her abuser will do what her abuser will do if she leaves. She fears he will take their children. She fears being divorced and her being a single parent. She fears the financial consequences of separation or divorce. She fears living alone. She fears being dependent on others for help. She fears the stigma of others learning about her abuse. She fears she is crazy because she is continually told that she is crazy. The abused need to cry out to God. Psalms 119.22 says, Ensure your servant's well-being. Let not the arrogant oppress me. So separation without divorce. Question. If a wife separates from her husband, is she not ultimately divorcing her husband or at least opening the door to divorce? The answer is no. The husband is the one who has opened the door to separation by his violence, not his wife. He is accountable to God for his own sin as well as the consequences of his sin. Separation is not divorce and does not open the door to divorce, but instead opens the door to safety and obedience to God. Separation is siding with God regarding his hatred of violence. Psalms 11.5 says, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. Separation from an abusive husband is trusting God to do what is best for her marriage rather than trusting in anything she might do. She takes literally the Bible's promise to her. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So why does she leave? It is one of the most difficult things she'll ever do, and it is one of the best things she could ever do. Leaving. Taking that crucial step to curtail the cycle of abuse benefits everyone involved and ushers in the opportunity for a fresh, new beginning. The woman no longer feels, excuse me, no, the woman no longer lives in fear or faces abuse in her own home. The man can better grasp the gravity of the abusive situation and seek biblical counseling. The children are protected and spared further trauma from witnessing their father abuse their mother. But it is by no means easy for a woman to walk away from the abuser. It is critical to enlist a supportive circle of friends who can help you maintain your resolve and help meet your needs during such a vulnerable time. And above all, seek the guiding, protective hand of God to give you the grace and strength to take that first step out the door. Isaiah 46, 4 says, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Isn't that just beautiful to hear that? She leaves because she finally realizes that he won't change. His circumstances remain the same. 
She understands that leaving may be the only way to motivate him to change. She can now see him acting on his threats of severe physical, mental, or emotional abuse. She sees his abuse is occurring more frequently. She sees he has begun to abuse the children. She wants to prevent their children from adopting abusive mindsets and behaviors. She has found help through friends, family, church, or professional organizations. She realizes it's not God's will for anyone to be abused. She realizes there's a thin line between threats and homicide. She needs to continuously pray. Psalm 7 verse 9 says, O righteous God who searches minds and hearts, bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. Scripture reveals that many times godly people did separate physically from their ungodly authorities because submission would have caused them to violate God's standard or his revealed will. Biblically, we are to submit to our governing civic authorities unless doing so would lead to sin or lead to harm. Notice, Jesus escaped the murderous plots of the religious leaders. The disciples of Jesus defied the mandate from the religious leaders that they stop preaching about Jesus. David fled King Saul with God's blessing. Although David was one of the king's subjects, when Saul's actions became violent, David escaped. 1 Samuel 18, 12, and then 19, 10 says, The Lord was with David, but had left Saul. Saul tried to pin him to the wall with a spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Submission. Here's a question. Since the Bible teaches submit to one another, is it leaving an abusive relationship against the teachings of the Bible? Here's the answer. The Bible teaches mutual submission in a loving relationship, not one-way submission in an abusive relationship. The specific biblical instruction to anyone around a hot-tempered person is separation. Get out of harm's way. Even a temporary separation could help bring about a permanent resolution and hopefully eventually reconciliation. A person with out-of-control anger must be willing to stop the abuse and get help. Many times, temporarily removing yourself from a volatile, volatile situation will prompt your abuser to seek help for fear of losing you. Not always, but sometimes. The Bible gives this instruction. At Proverbs 22, 24, it reads, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered hot man. Do not associate with one easily angered. And the very next verse continues with this warning of staying in a volatile situation. Proverbs 22, 25 says, Or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Wow. So I'm going to stop right there. It's over 10 minutes, and I apologize for that. I've tried not to go over 10 minutes. Please, if you need help, reach out. There will always be someone around. It doesn't have to be me. It could be anyone. It could be a friend or neighbor, the police, counselor. But please reach out to someone. Abuse is not tolerated by God. And I pray that's not tolerated by you too. As a former abuse victim, I understand more than anyone will ever know. I've been abused since I was a child all the way on up until my early 30s with my first husband. And I'm telling you what. My kids are scarred from that. I'm scarred from that. And I don't wish that upon anyone. So please be safe. Remember that God loves you. And so do I. Have a great night.